Welcome back guys. Today we will talk about the new TriHackMe SOC simulator. In this newly released feature, we will explore a security operations center simulation of real world attacks. We will go through the generated alerts, investigate the cyber attacks, use the available analysis tools such as Splunk, and at the end we will write a case report. We will do the phishing unfolding challenge in this video and in later videos, we will cover more challenges related to security operations, center and blue teaming. Let's get started. My advice, if this is the first time you work with the SOC simulator, is to check out the documentation. In here we get full information about the scenarios, as well as the documentation of the tools and the recommended steps that you may take while approaching the incident analysis process. So here we have the company information, tool documentation. This explains the tools that are provided in the SOC simulator. So first here we have the security information event management can be found here. And we have the analyst workstation, which can also be found by clicking on the analyst VM. And also we have the functions of the analyst VM, such as email alert review and the system access. So if you want to check and analyze an email attachment, you can do that in the analyst workstation. If you want to analyze the events and correlate data, you do that using the SIEM tool. The SIEM tool provided here is Splunk. And in the alert triage, it offers recommended steps in order to approach the analysis. So here, as you can see, first we have the alert triage documentation. So first we have an initial alert review, then we do the investigation. And if we need to, we investigate using the SIEM and the analyst workstation. Note on handling email alerts and resolution and closure, it's where you write the case report. Okay, so we go to dashboard and we have real time numbers. For example, here we have the total alerts that were reported up until now. In total, we have 52 alerts and the closed alerts. The closed alerts is actually, or they represent the number of alerts that have been uh, owned by an analyst and later on closed and determined to be either false positive or true uh, positive. Closed as TP is closed as true positive, closed as FP, closed as false positive. Here we can see we have one alert classified or closed as true positive. Okay, then we have the alert types. We have a pie where the red color represents the phishing alerts. And then we have the blue one represents the process alerts. And then we have the execution alerts. We can also view the alerts using the severity. In total, we have 15 more alerts. The, as you can see guys, the low alerts or the low severity alerts occupy most of the pie here. And on the second degree, we have the high severity alerts occupying or having nine alerts in total in this region. On the right hand side, we have the open alerts. The open alerts represent the alerts that have not yet seen an action, meaning that an analyst has not yet owned or taken ownership of the alert. So how to start the investigation? So we go to the alert queue and we can see breakdown of the reported alerts. We can filter the alerts based on the severity, the status and the alert type. When you approach the incident investigation, it's better to or you approach investigating the alerts. It's better to sort the alerts based on the severity. So we have low, medium, high, critical. Assigning a priority to your investigation is very important. It's, also, it's always recommended to start with critical alerts. So there are no critical reported alerts up until this moment. Okay, we go to high and we have these high alerts. As you can see, there is one closed alert. This alert has been closed and determined to be true positive. There is no action that needs to be taken regarding this alert. Now we check the other alerts. Here we have the date. And they're all reported the same date, exact timestamp. Let's have a look at this one. Suspicious parent-child relationship. Let's have a look here. And we read it through the description. A suspicious process with an uncommon parent-child relationship was detected in your environment. This is the reason why the alert was reported in the first place. There is, um, there is no harmony in the relationship between the child and the parent process. The system does not expect 
uh, a relationship to exist between these two reported processes. Let's take a look at the processes. So the process name is NSLOOKUP, which is used to perform DNS queries, and the parent process is PowerShell. So here PowerShell was used to launch NSLOOKUP. We can see the process command line. So here is the process command line. So NSLOOKUP was used to perform a DNS query to this domain. Actually, it is a subdomain, but the subdomain value here is kind of encoded. And we have the domain name ends with IO. So there are DNS queries performed or sent to this DNS name. Okay. And the parent process is PowerShell. Indeed, it's actually worth investigating why uh, would PowerShell be a parent process to NSLOOKUP. The parent process to NSLOOKUP should be CMD, right? You launch NSLOOKUP from the command line or the Windows command line. But in this case here, we see NSLOOKUP being launched through PowerShell, which is worth investigating. So if you, when you decide that you want to take ownership of this alert, what you can do here, you can click on the icon here. And here we have successfully taken ownership of alert with event ID 1039. Now, once we click on take ownership, the option of writing a case report shows up here. When we finish an investigation, we can immediately click on write case report and present our findings. But we are not finished yet. What we have to do, we want to extend the analysis. We can click on the seam. This will launch Splunk here, where we can proceed with our investigation. Let's go through the given details here. So we have NSLOOKUP and we have PowerShell and we have the query. We can start searching with any one of these given parameters. So in Splunk, we write the index equal asterisk to retrieve all the events and we click on search. This will give us around 313 events. All right, we start the investigation, but we want, what we can do here, we can go back and maybe search with NSLOOKUP. When we search with NSLOOKUP, we have around 10 events. Let's take a look at these events and we start with the very first one. These are sorted in a descending order, starting with the most recent one. If you want to process them chronologically, you can go down, scroll down, and start from here. So we see that's the first launch of NSLOOKUP, and it was launched by PowerShell. That's the directory from which the PowerShell process was launched. It was launched from users Michael Asko downloads exfiltration. Okay, and we take a note here of the parent process ID. The process parent ID is 3728. This is the process ID of PowerShell. However, 552020, it is the process ID of NS lookup. Okay, we go on with the investigation. We see other DNS queries sent to this domain name through NS lookup. And the following events follow the same. All right, so we want to investigate why PowerShell is the main process, the parent process ID or the parent process of NS lookup. Basically, what we can do here, we can actually see that the parent process ID is the same across all events. It is 3728, because it is the same process PowerShell. Okay, let's go investigate this parent process ID. So we reset this, and from here we choose process parent PID 3728. This will give you all the events where, uh, related to the PowerShell. So at the very first, we have this. So PowerShell was launched, and there was another process that was considered as a child to PowerShell, which is NetEXE. Here, it's used to map a file share, SSF financial records. And then we see that it was used to delete the share itself. And then we see the, the DNS queries. Looks like here that this uh, file share, right, was actually exfiltrated using NSLOOKUP in the form of DNS queries. That's my initial theory about this incident. But we need to investigate more. We need to continue the investigation. We cannot actually uh, arrive to conclusions just by uh, looking at these weird DNS queries. All right, now, next thing we want to do, we can, now we know that PowerShell is being used in a suspicious uh, way. We can just copy this and search through all PowerShell events. So now we have around 68 events. At the very beginning here, we can see that um, the process command line, the first use of PowerShell here, that was the command PowerShell, and it was used to download 
a script. The script name is PowerCat. Now, if you Google PowerCat, you see that PowerCat is a privilege, a privilege escalation and exfiltration script. A PowerShell TCP IP Swiss Army knife that works with Netcat and NCAT. So you can generate payloads, you can do relays, you can encrypt the payloads using SSL, and you can do file transfer and exfiltration. Let's go back here to Spawn. So PowerShell was used to download PowerCat. And then after PowerCat was downloaded, you can see PowerCat was launched to connect and establish a command and control center using ngrock. So then, now everything is becoming obvious. The attacker first downloaded PowerCat and established a command and control channel. If we move on to the other events, PowerShell again was used to launch another process, which is system info. The attacker here is retrieving information about the system. Then the attacker is retrieving information about the user and the privileges of the user that he actually compromised. And we see the attacker enumerating the users, the local groups, and then executing part view. And then we have this, look at this. There is um, a file that was created or stored in this path. It is PS policy test vsp.ps1. It's file creation event. And then we have process creation event where the attacker access the financial record share. Then the attacker used robocopy, right, to copy the share into another directory, then deleted the existing share, and then attacker started exfiltrating the data by zipping them into a file named exfiltme, and then he started to exfiltrate the data using NSLOOKUP. So now everything is clear about what happened in this incident. If we go back here, we are sure now that this alert is true positive. So we're at case report, and here we select true positive. Okay, here we fill information about the report. Case report, please write a detailed report on the steps taken to analyze and contain this incident, including all the relevant information and the rationale for its closure. So what do we write here? Let's say um, we start first by saying that the attacker uh, downloaded PowerCat from GitHub, then proceeded and established a C2 server using ng rock, right? Then the attacker used PowerShell to launch um, maybe or to enumerate the compromised system using tools or using processes such as who am I and system info The attacker mapped the file shares on the compro compromised machine and discovered a share that contains financial records. The attacker, as we see, as we saw earlier, used um, Robocopy to copy the share to a separate path and zipped it. What was the file name that was zipped? It is xfilme. Named, that's the file name. Then the attacker used nslookup to perform DNS data exfiltration. Does this alert require escalation? Um, for now, it does not require ex escalation. But if you want to enrich your security rules or, uh, or detection rules, you want to investigate the domain name here, right? So let's say for now, does this alert require escalation? Nope, and we submit and close the alert. Okay, now if you want to see the alerts that you have closed, you can go to case reports and you can see all the alerts that you have closed.
The most recent one, recent one is the one with the ID 1039. We have a look here, you can click on view report, and that's the report that we have submitted. You can also edit the report if you have something to add or delete. And that was it. You can continue with the rest of the alerts from the alert queue. And you can also use the playbooks. It's empty for, for now. It's coming soon. It's not ready yet. So guys, that was the SOC simulator. An example, and by the way, the SOC simulator that I'm doing was fishing unfolding. When you're finished, you can exit the simulation.